Out of all existing social media platforms, Twitter is the one that has drawn the most attention in recent years. Supposedly a digital town hall, Twitter has become a place where ideological battles are taking place, where political entities are engaged in mudslinging, where misinformation and disinformation campaigns are run with full intensity and where the course of modern nation states is decided. With so much at stake, it is Full hardy for Vijaya Garde to go on the rampage banning accounts left, right and center. Sorry, not left, because George Soros won't permit her to do that. Now that Musk has taken charge, the dirt is coming out in the open. In India, people generally associated with Hindu causes were the main target. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Akanksha and this is TFI Post. In the latest release of Twitter files, the focus is on India. A few days ago, Matt Tayyabi investigation revealed the names of organizations involved in scuttling the voices of Hindus in India. Not surprisingly, these people came up with detailed documents in order to get Twitter to do the job for them. Their shrewdness can be gauged from the fact that it happened after Donald Trump's account was banned at the beginning of 2021. The precedent was set. After that, it became politically easier for Twitter and their trusted allies to go on a rampage against anyone or any organization bearing even the remotest resemblance to Trump. Trump is derided by this lobby for raising nationalist sentiments in the USA. The same treatment is meted out to anyone speaking for the renaissance of Hinduism in India. The left-wing lobby in India knew that if they fed fake information to Twitter, the company would be swift in banning these accounts. The Wire, infamous for hate mongers like Siddharth, Vardarajan, Arfa Khanu, Sherwani, Karan Thapar, and not to forget Rana Ayub, decided to take the charge. The Wire allegedly conducted an investigation into coordinated disinformation and online harassment in India. Its reporters decided to associate all kinds of evilness with the ruling Bharatiya Janta Party. They went as far as collecting 40,000 Twitter accounts and submitting them to Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab. Before we get into the nitty-gritty of this organization, it is worthwhile to decode the sleight of hand played by the wire. What they did was collect the biggest possible data set of accounts. They know that even the most ardent of investigative agencies won't go deep into checking every account and their tweets. It is impossible for Twitter since its staff capacity has never been large enough to reach a conclusion within a few days. The only viable option for them is to trust the source and ban all of them. It was to increase the trust factor that the publication decided to contract DFR Lab. On its LinkedIn page, DFR Lab describes itself as the world's leading hub of digital forensic analysts tracking events in governance, technology and security. Its job is to supposedly expose falsehoods and fake news, document human rights abuses and build digital resilience worldwide. The lab is owned by the Atlantic Council, which is an American think tank. It has a six-decade-long history and is headquartered in Washington. From there, it strives to work building a trust bridge between North America and Europe. Funders of the Atlantic Council include foreign governments as well. With such a heavy institutional backing, the trust factor comes automatically for DFR Labs. The fact that the American government itself is one of the funders of the lab just buttresses it. The money is sourced through the US State Department's Global Engagement Center. The center was formed in the heyday of the Obama administration. The American Department of State oversees it. GEC works in close coordination with reputed agencies like the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, National Security Agency, CIA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, Special Operations Command, and others. Clearly, there is a credibility risk for the US government in publishing any investigative piece done by tainted organizations like The Wire. 
In their latest Medium post, the lab has revealed that it went a bit deep into investigation and found it to be unauthentic. Quote, one of their reporters at the time collected the data set and shared it with our team. He attributed the tweets to the BJP, but his analysis failed to meet our research standards. To put it simply, it was a shoddy research by a self-proclaimed journalist at the wire. However, the DFR lab seems to be playing a double game here. We have reasons for the doubt. Apart from the American government, there is another famous or rather infamous entity that pours money into this organization. It is none other than George Soros. Talking about Soros, have you seen the picture called Vulture and Little Girl? The Vulture is waiting for the little girl to die so that it can eat her flesh. Drawing parallels, George Soros is the Vulture and that little girl is the national economy all across the world. The man has made fortunes out of disturbing the economic equilibrium in countries like South Korea, Indonesia, Thailand, Hong Kong, Laos, Malaysia, the Philippines, mainland China, Japan, Singapore, Taiwan, Vietnam and even the United Kingdom. He looks at growing economies, bets against them, uses his influence to bring turmoil to those geographies and finally make fortunes by short selling. His next target is India, and he has been trying it for years now. PM Modi and the people who support him, which include the majority of India, are big obstacle to his dreams. That is a big reason why, even after finding it inauthentic, the DFR lab found it appropriate to forward it to Twitter. What? Isn't it ironic? How can I recommend something that I myself don't find authentic and original? Isn't it dishonesty? Yes, it is. It is the very definition of cheating. Apparently, loyalty to sorrows matters more than truth in this post-truth world. In the mailing list sent to Twitter, one of the analysts at DFR Labs cutely wrote, Hi guys, attached you will find around 40k Twitter accounts that our researchers suspect are engaging in inauthentic behavior and Hindu nationalism more broadly. In its defense, DFR Labs has claimed that it was only following and here it is the funny part, due diligence. Basically, the VIO and DFR Labs want you to believe that 40,000 people were coordinating on Twitter to advance the cause of Hindu nationalism. Either we are actually stupid to believe them or they think 1.4 billion Indians are stupid to make fun of. Just a cursory reading of the list will tell you about their understanding of the average Indian mind. A few prominent names on the list include the National Crime Investigation Bureau of Uttar Pradesh, the Office of Commerce Minister Piyush Koyal, IPS Sandeep Mittal, Olympian Manu Bhakar and BJP leaders Ashok Goyal and Baby Kumari. It is a classic case of finding evidence with a conclusion in mind rather than reaching a conclusion. By neutrally looking at the available evidence, you can expect them only from leftists. Thankfully, Twitter staff were in a good mood that day. They went into details about a few of these accounts. Lots of the people operating these accounts were settled in the United States of America. One of them named Bobby Hailstone said that he is a Republican supporter and that too of the Ronald Reagan version of the party. Twitter's trust and safety officer, Yol Roth, one of the main leads is banning Trump, also found them inauthentic. The document, though inauthentic, established a bias among Twitter staff regarding the connection between the American right wing and PM Modi's support base. It became the basis on which Twitter went on an anti-Hindu spree. Prominent Indian accounts spreading awareness about Hindus had been banned. Few of them have been restored by Musk, while many still remain in oblivion.